Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending the webinar today. Today's webinar, Total Diffuse CO2 Flux Across Yellowstone, Going Beyond Thermally Active Altered Basins for Adequate Quantification, is presented by Drs. Tobias Fisher and Kristen Rahili today. Um, just a little background. Kristen is a Frontiers of Science postdoctoral fellow and lecturer in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia. She received her PhD from the University of New Mexico, where she spent time in the field measuring diffuse carbon dioxide flux at Yellowstone Caldera, Valles Caldera in New Mexico, and across geothermal, geothermal sites in southwestern Utah. Dr. Fisher, uh, Tobias Fisher, has over 25 years of experience with volcanic gas sampling and analysis. Uh, recently, he has led an international group of researchers to better constrain global volcanic carbon emissions through the Deep Carbon Observatory and is currently leading a research coordination network on coordinating the scientific community with USGS volcano ob observatories uh, to respond to volcanic eruptions in the US. He is director of the University of New Mexico Volatiles Laboratory where analysis of major and trace gases and gas and water sample using gas chromatography and, and quadrupole mass spectro hmm. <clears throat> and quadrupole mass spectrometry are routinely performed. Uh, the format for today will be for all of you to remain on mute. Um, they have a fantastic presentation planned. And uh, if you can put any of your questions into the chat, we would appreciate it. And then they will address your questions uh, following their presentation. If, if your question doesn't get addressed, we will be sure to um, have them respond to you personally, or we will respond on their behalf. So um, please, Kristen and Tobias, go right ahead and do your presentation. All right, thank you so much, Carrie, and thank you to PP Systems for having us. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen to start. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, as Carrie said, we're going to talk today about some diffuse CO2 flux measurements that we made across Yellowstone Caldera, as well as outside the caldera, and really thinking about how we can go beyond thermally altered basins, including what we call cold degassing basins in our estimate for quantification of total CO2 flux. Oh. Okay, so here, for those of you who are not volcanologists or not familiar with diffuse flux measurements, we're talking about what we call diffuse CO2 emissions from volcanoes. And in this little graphic here, I show you basically what that means. So when we say diffuse CO2, we're talking about CO2 that's emitted through soils. So in this picture here, you can see Castle Geyser at Yellowstone. And so we would focus our attention on measuring all of the soils surrounding the active geyser cone, but we would not measure the CO2 or other gases coming out of the geyser cone itself. And so it's basically anything that is not what we call a point source. So here a point source would be a vent or a fumarole or in Yellowstone's case, a bubbling pool. And so we can look at some estimations, prior estimations, of total CO2 emissions from what we call point sources. So these are, to remind you, those vents or fumaroles. And so this is a graph of CO2 flux in teragrams per year. And we've labeled two things here. So we have passive degassing on the left with the little blue dot and eruptive degassing on the right. For those of you who are not volcanologists, passive degassing basically means the day-to-day -day degassing of a volcano that's not related to elevated eruptive activity, and um, eruptive degassing is where gases are coming out during an active eruption. So here we can see that prior estimates show that passive degassing has about 51 teragrams per year and eruptive degassing only contributes about a little less than two teragrams per year of CO2. Now, if we focus in on diffuse degassing, so that's the gases that come out of soil surrounding these point sources, we can see that Estimates are 90 teragrams per year globally for all volcanoes with a very large uncertainty. And so we're gonna focus in quickly on why that large uncertainty exists. And the reason that large uncertainty 
uncertainty exists is the reason that we're here today. It's because we have to actually go into the field and measure the CO2 flux from the soils in volcanic areas at the actual soil air interface. And that's largely because the CO2 background in the atmosphere is far too large for us to be able to measure it remotely. And so if we look here in this picture, I'm using the EGM-5 portable CO2 analyzer with attached soil respiration chamber. And we can see that there are basically two major pieces to this. So we have a soil respiration chamber that I place on the ground surface. And then the infrared analyzer in this box measures the change in CO2. So here we're measuring a flux. We're looking at a change in CO2 concentration per time per unit area. So the gas out and the gas in, the change of the of CO2 concentration over a specific unit of time and area. And in the field, we get a measurement of grams of CO2 per meter square per hour, which we then convert to grams of CO2 per meter square per day. And so our first step in the field is to collect point measurements. So here's an example site in Yellowstone, and you can see all of the individual point measurements that we collected across the site. You can see that there are always these logistical issues when you're in the field. Um, for instance, rain was looking like it was coming in and we had to kind of hurry up with this last bit. Things happen in the field, but our first step is to sort of scan the area, take a look and start making these point measurements. We also collect gas samples for later carbon isotope composition analysis analysis of soil CO2. So here are two um, pictures demonstrating that. So we use these little 12 milliliter um, borosilicate vials and we um, go ahead and place our soil respiration chamber on the soil surface. We let uh, soil CO2 accumulate into the chamber for a period of time from 15 minutes, if it's a really high flux area, to an hour, if I'm trying to look at a vegetation or a background spot. So if I want to measure a vegetated area that I don't think much CO2 from a volcano is coming out. And so you see here in this picture, we have um, the gas out. Um, sort of outlet for the EGM-5, we go ahead and connect that vial. And um, once we have enough CO2 accumulated in the chamber, we then just divert the gas into the vial. You can also see from both of these EGM-5s that at Yellowstone, we're dealing with very high CO2 fluxes in areas. So this is actually, I said flux, but this is actually a um, real-time CO2 concentration. So we have almost 82,000 over here ppm, and we have almost 95,000 ppm over here. So just a brief overview of Yellowstone, if you are not quite as familiar with it beyond the tourist attractions. So Yellowstone caldera is the latest um, caldera forming eruption of an intracontinental mantle plume. And so you can see here in red, this is Yellowstone National Park. And then the caldera is this, um, is uh, this, black outline and um, Yellowstone caldera erupted about 0.64 million years ago. And if we zoom into Yellowstone National Park, we can see that in our study, we wanted to make a very um, good distribution of sites that were previously measured. So here's all of the previous studies that measured sites in Yellowstone, as well as some new sites. And we also really wanted to distribute sites um, amongst those that were inside the caldera. So this yellow region and sites that were outside the caldera. So one really important piece of information is that previously, the most widely used estimate of total diffuse CO2 flux from all of Yellowstone National Park was 45 plus or minus 16 kilotons of CO2 per day. And that was by Warner and Brantley in 2003. And so we come here to this side. 
second part of our title. So going behind beyond thermally active altered basins for adequate quantification of total CO2 flux. And so here I'm going to focus a little bit on this terminology, thermally active versus cold degassing. And you can see here just um, the EGM-5 in one of our cold degassing sites. And so what is the basic difference between these two types of sites. On the left, you see thermally active sites. So these are thermally elevated heat flux. So the um, soil heat flux is elevated above background heat, regional heat flux. They often have large vents, fumaroles, and bubbling pools in Yellowstone. So here obviously is an example of um, Old Faithful. And here is um, Mammoth Terraces. And so you can see here that um, both of these instances, we have an active geyser and we have bubbling pools. So both of these have an elevated heat flux above those background levels. In cold degassing sites, we label these as thermally inactive. So these sites, the soil does not have an elevated heat flux above background levels. Um, so if we were to look at a map of um, you know, thermal radiation, you would see that the, the thermal radiation that's coming from these cold degassing sites would be the same as that that's coming from non-volcanic regions. So these are going to be large basins, like you see in this picture, or very small patches, about less than 0 0.002 kilometers squared of altered soil with elevated CO2. And you can often recognize them because they will have um, be largely altered. So they'll have that white appearance. And so here's an example of a smaller um, coal degassing site on the side of the road at the east entrance road. And so there are two major points that we want you to remember in the next couple of slides. Point one is that previous work um, by Warner and Brantley in 2003 showed that soil chemistry really nicely correlates to diffuse CO2 flux. So there are three major types of soil chemistries at Yellowstone. There's acid sulfate soils. An example of that is mud volcano, which you can see here. Travertine soils, this was Mammoth Hot Spring, those terraces that I showed you. And then neutral chloride soils would be your Old Faithful, your Upper Geyser Basin. And so we can see here that um, Warner, Warner and Brantley found that the highest diffuse CO2 flux is found from acid sulfate soils, and the lowest diffuse CO2 flux is found from neutral chloride soils. The second point, and this is the point that I already mentioned, is that our previous estimates of CO2 flux were 45 plus or minus 16 kilotons of CO2 per day. Now, the important addition to this is that we are assuming here that the elevated diffuse CO2 only occurs from thermally active soils. So when we're making an estimate, there's no way that we can measure every single point in Yellowstone. It's way too big and takes way too long to do despite the fact that that would be amazing. Um, so here we have to actually um, extrapolate out. And in the extrapolation done by Warner and Brantley, they assumed that only thermally active or thermally elevated soils had elevated diffuse CO2 flux. This study also uses the mean of individual flux points. And this is also going to be a difference that um, was done in our study. And so. Um, our second sort of step after making our individual points in the field is then to make a continuous flux surface. So this is gonna be our final output. And you can see here in this example, um, the individual points that I showed you earlier for this site, and then the continuous flux surface. And what we do is we use ArcGIS Gaussian geostatistical simulations. We create tense simulations over these individual um, flux measurements, and then we take the mean of those 10 simulations as our final output, and then we take the standard deviation of those 10 simulations. So we, we output these simulations, and then we integrate across them to get each individual cell of the simulation, how much CO2 is it emitting. Add all of that up, and we get a total CO2 flux for the whole site area.
So why do we model a continuous flux surface in our study rather than just looking at the mean of individual flux points? Well, the average, for example, of all of these points in this site was 884.5 grams per meter square per day. This value is actually 80% larger than the values at this site. So the majority of values are actually much smaller than this. And so the individual um, flux points, the mean of those values are highly skewed towards very, very high flux points. So for instance, this point right here was 24,000 grams per meter square per day. So this is going to just skew our data towards those very, very high flux points, whereas the majority of the other points are lower flux. And so once we know the uh, the total CO2 flux per site, we can no, then create an average of total CO2 flux per soil chemistry. And so in this graph here, you see tons of CO2 per kilometer square per day versus our main soil chemistries at Yellowstone. So just so you remember, we have acid sulfate sites and in acid sulfate, we've separated them into thermally active versus cold degassing. We have travertine sites and then our neutral chloride sites. And so you can see here we've gotten an average. And um, I want to point out here that our acid sulfate cold degassing, this is a major difference for our study, is sort of breaking out these two into thermally active versus cold degassing. Once we get our average per soil chemistry, we then can multiply by the total area of those alteration chemistry. So um, once we've done that, we then add it all up and we get a total diffuse CO2 flux from Yellowstone of 24 plus or minus 12 kilotons of CO2 per day. And then Tobias, I think this is yours. All right. Well, that's really interesting. So you have this uh, flux of CO2 coming out of Yellowstone and you can um, split it up in terms of the thermally active areas and the cold degassing areas. And so you get a total flux. The next question is, you know, what is the source of this CO2? Obviously, that's a massive amount of CO2 coming out of the ground. And knowing where it comes from is really an important part of the study. So we can use carbon isotopes of uh, CO2 collected in those vials that Kristen showed you right from the PP systems analyzer. And we can take those vials back to the lab and do carbon isotope analyses of those samples. And that, the results you see here on the X axis, you have concentration in one over PPM. So the higher the concentration, the further you go to the left on this, uh, on this X axis. On the Y axis, you have the delta 13C value of CO2 uh, plotted against, um, against the standard. So on the very right side, there's the air con concentration and the uh, carbon isotope composition of air. And on the left side of the diagram, you see the data from these cold degassing sites. And what you can see is that they cluster very closely in the region between zero and minus five um, per mil uh, delta 13C. And that, that value clearly overlaps with Yellowstone fumaroles, which are shown here in the gray area, in the gray uh, color. So that indicates to us that the source of CO2 based on carbon isotopes is the same as the fumarole gases that come out of Yellowstone in these larger degassing sites in these point sources. Now, what does that value mean? That value is a typical value really for an upper mantle contribution or a mantle contribution of CO2. So what we're looking at is really deep CO2 um, uh, coming out of Yellowstone. Now in the next slide, this is now all the data, including uh, the higher temperature sites as well as the cold degassing sites. And we see again that the majority of data points plots between zero and minus five indicating a strong mantle component uh, to the CO2 discharges. There are some values that are lighter and those values have uh, biogenic contributions. So if there's um, organic matter that decays underground or close to the surface, that will affect those carbon isotopes and will make them lighter, uh, uh, showing 
showing this, this influence. But you can see that the majority of CO2 at Yellowstone, those high fluxes are clearly derived from deep mantle CO2. Now, next slide. Now, uh, we have the fluxes and we have the source. We know that the flux is high. We know the source is from the mantle. And the next step that we can do is uh, just compare it to active volcanoes worldwide. This is a CO2 flux accumulation from uh, actively degassing volcanoes. This does not um, include diffuse degassing at this point, but we can see that um, the Yellowstone uh, CO2 flux of about 8,800 kilotons of CO2 per year plots at a very, very high um, level above many volcanoes that are known to produce much uh, high CO2 levels, high CO2 fluxes. For example, Etna, Bagana, Kilauea, Manam and other, and other volcanoes are plotted here. So Yellowstone uh, is a significant emitters, emitter of a CO2 flux, even if you compare it to um, actively degassing volcanoes. Now, next slide. Again, this is a different, a little bit different perspective of how important Yellowstone is. We have here uh, volcanic degassing. This is in teragrams of CO2 per year. Volcanic degassing overall, we have the volcanic plume degassing, about 51 um, teragrams of CO2 per year. Diffuse emissions, the 92 teragrams that Kristen already showed. And here's Yellowstone of the eight, eight or nine teragrams of CO2 per year. So again, Yellowstone is an important contributor to the diffuse emissions and therefore an important contributor to the overall volcanic degassing on this planet. On the right side of this diagram, we have tectonic degassing and those are emissions from things like continental rift and um, that is really dominated by mid-ocean ridges and, and the, the East African rift. Uh, but there are very few measurements for continental rifts currently. Now in the next slide, however, we uh, still need to put this into a broader perspective. And what's shown here is um, the global carbon dioxide budget from Le Carré et al uh, paper that recently came out of the five years ago or so now, so maybe updated, but we see that fossil fuels and industry are the major uh, emitters of, of carbon dioxide. So you have the volcanic here, 0 0.05, and that volcanic actually uh, includes all the diffuse degassing, all the uh, tectonic degassing put together. And we see that it is still a much smaller amount uh, by, by a couple of orders of magnitude than uh, the, the CO2 produced by uh, fossil, fossil fuel burning. Next slide. However, uh, Yellowstone is shown here is, is significant. You see that um, Yellowstone number is 0 0.02. The whole around eruption is shown here. Pinatubo eruption are, you know, these are eruptive uh, emissions, which are you know, relatively very, very short lived for only a few months or, or a couple of years. And then emissions go way down. Yellowstone produces these high emissions over many, many decades, maybe hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, maybe millions of years, right? And uh, we can compare those, um, those emissions from Yellowstone again to all subaerial volcanic emissions. And uh, we can also compare them to emissions in the past. And the point is that including Yellowstone and an, and an adequate or accurate as possible uh, quantification of the Yellowstone emission is very important in understanding the overall global CO2 budget. And I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Ah, and one then, more. Yeah, just to talk about our major conclusions. So basically, coal degassing acid sulfate soils are a significant contributor towards total diffuse CO2 emissions. And that's largely because um, I great proportion of Yellowstone National Park is covered by these cold degassing acid sulfate soils. So about 67% of that 24 plus or minus 12 kilotons CO2 comes from cold degassing. And we can also see that um, our comparison 
from comparisons with the Warner and Brantley study shows that they um, estimated 45 kilotons per day of CO2, and we estimate 24 kilotons of CO2 per day. And so we believe that this is a more reliable estimation method because of our use of these continuous flux surfaces, and we also include coal degassing acid sulfate sites. And then finally, coal degassing acid sulfate soil gases have carbon isotope compositions that are within the range of typical Yellowstone fumarole gases, telling us that the gas that is being emitted at these coal degassing sites are, is similar in source to those gases that are emitted from Yellowstone fumaroles. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. It's interesting. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we do have some questions for you. Um, the, uh, we have a Robert Bogue who said on slide nine, it seems like the western half of the area has very few points. How accurate would you expect the flux estimations are from that half? Uh, does your estimate of the total flux change at all? Does, does, does your estimate of the total flux change at all if you only use the eastern half of the site where you have a lot more data? That's an excellent question. And I think it's a very, very good point in that we are basing our information on these 19 sites that we've included. Um, and there are obviously many more sites in Yellowstone to be covered. The reason that that Western area has far fewer points is because it's very logistically difficult to get there. Um, and so what we do in the field is we select a site and then we spend one day at that site and then go to another site. And so with a lot of the sites in the Western half, um, you know, they just take a lot more logistics to get there, a lot more time invested to get there. And so this is obviously just a, a contribution to something that was started decades ago in understanding Yellowstone, but we certainly need Need more from the western half of Yellowstone National Park, as well as more sites that are cold degassing. We've only looked at four, but there are, are certainly others out there that need to be found. Um, and one site that was focused on by Bergfeld et al. in 2012 was Brimstone Basin, which is that purple dot that you see here in the southeastern corner of the park. Um, and Brimstone Basin is another coal degassing large basin um, that Bergfeld et al. found um, to have about, I believe, 200 tons of CO2 um, per day. Wow. So that very good point. <laughs> oh. uh, we have another question. Um... Uh, Lorenzo Capelli, uh, really interesting talk. Question is, regarding the collection of samples and vials, do, do, did you obtain positive feedback leaving the chamber to flush for 15 minutes up to an hour instead of using methods for removing air contamination like those proposed by uh, Ciodini 2008, like double sampling and perform a mass balance later on? So we, um, in those vial samples, we definitely collected, I collected six per location and then measured about three. I had three left over just in case I messed up on the mass spectrometer and then took the average. Um, and with your question about air contamination, yeah, we didn't use any methods like with mass balance in terms of that way, but what we did do um, we did do is, um, you know, leave the, the soil respiration chamber there for as long as we possibly could, especially with those vegetation sites an hour to try and get out as much air as we could, or at least dilute the air as much as we could with the soil gas that we were interested in. And then with the uh, no isotope compositions, just kind of looking at um, proportion of air using that, the air isotopic composition. Um, so, so we didn't do anything in that regard, but we did take multiple samples per point and also try to leave it for as long as possible to dilute that air component as much as possible. Okay, great. Um, does anyone else have any other questions before we wrap up this amazing webinar? I don't see any more here. Um, Actually, I, um, I, sorry, there oh. is one, um, the first one in the chat. 
any correlation between carbon isotope data and data from gas analyzer EGM5? Um, I'm not sure what that's referring to. I think it may be referring to um, whether in areas of high flux, we have uh, oh. different type of isotope data or different isotope data compared to areas of low flux, perhaps? Um, so it's really dependent on, um, you know, if we go back to the isotope data, let me move my thing here. So if we go back to our isotope data, um, we can see that um, the thermal, thermally active acid sulfate sites, the cold degassing acid sulfate sites, all of the, the points clustered together, um, we did see, you know, lighter <laughs> delta C13 values for sites that had very low flux. And that's likely related to not the fact that, you know, volcanic gases aren't coming from Lone Star Geyser and Grand Geyser, which are that, that blue and yellow dot. Those are two sites that are either within the upper geyser basin or very close to the upper geyser basin. It's not necessarily that there aren't volcanic gases coming from there. It's just the fact that the fluxes are very low. And so it was very difficult for us to get a highly concentrated, you know, volcanic gas versus a biogenic or atmospheric gas. And so, um, you know, with, with these sites, it definitely correlates to the higher flux they have, the, the more the isotopes will plot within that range of Yellowstone fumaroles. Okay, and then we, we do have one more question. Um, did you measure the same site on different days to check for temporal changes? That's an excellent question. Um, yes, so we did two sites, uh, the site let me get my laser. The site here, um, Porcelain Basin, we measured that on two different days during the summer of 2018 and then during snowfall or very cold weather in the summer of 2019. And um, for Porcelain Basin, we didn't see too many differences between times. Um, but for gas vents, which is here in the Sulfatara Plateau, we saw a large difference um, or larger difference between days. And that's an interesting addition to complicating this problem because in my estimation or our estimation of total CO2 flux from Yellowstone, I took the average of those three different days for gas vents for that site. Um, but you know, if this, if CO2, diffuse CO2 flux can vary based on other properties not related to the magma chamber, such as barometric pressure, wind speed, um, obviously ground temperature and whether the ground is frozen, then that's something that we need to consider. And that will also involve going out and taking more points, especially at times in the year that are, are different seasonally um, and different levels of, you know, where is the, the groundwater, for instance. And so gas vents and porcelain basins, we took on three different occurrences for each of those. Yes, uh, uh, the person who asked the question said, yes, exactly. I was thinking it would be interesting to see if there are any changes within a diurnal cycle or seasonal changes in these cold degassing sites, given the meteorological and plant respiration changes, et cetera. Yes, that would be fascinating. And especially we, you know, need to get out there possibly even at night to, to look if we can get rid of the biogenic component a little bit as well, um, if Yellowstone would let us do that. So I agree. I think that would be a fascinating route to take. Well, it sounds like the next webinar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this was, this was wonderful. We'll give you one more one more minute to ask any questions, if anybody has any for Kristen and, and Tobias. Looks like that's, oh, great presentation. We agree. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I think that's all of the questions again. If um, anyone has a question they think of later, feel free to, to contact me and I'll make sure they, they get the question for you. Um, Thank you so much. You guys did a fantastic job. I knew it would be amazing. So we really enjoyed it. And uh, we will make this uh, link available within the next week or so for people who missed it. And we'll send it to everybody that signed up for this. So if there's anyone you, know, you guys would like to share it with, feel free to.
And um, we were really looking forward to this and we really appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank happy. you, Tobias and Kristen. That was terrific. And thank you so much. <laughs> and you can get to class. Oh yeah, perfect. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for attending this webinar. To learn more about our soil solutions, visit ppsystems.com.